you and say, look, you learn more from your failures than from your successes. Specifically, in some ways, this has some resonance with Okay. Well, I'm a social psychologist, so I love data. So I want to start today's talk by gathering a little data from you guys. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a scenario, and I'm going to give you a choice, and I want to hear your choice in the scenario. So the scenario is that I'm arranging your marriage. Okay, so I'm going to pick out four spouses for you, and you need to choose one of those four spouses. And you need to choose very carefully because there's no divorce in this game. Okay, so don't <laughs> mess it up. Okay, so I'm gonna provide you with a variety of information. First, I'm gonna give you photographs of those uh, four potential spouses. And they're all gonna be smoking hot, so you can't make your decision based on that because I've done this based on all that I know about you, all your, your, what your preferred body type, your preferred style, your preferred uh, gender, whatever it is. So um, I'm going to give you those uh, four photos, but then here's, here's the question. I'm going to give you another opportunity to learn more about them, but you have to choose between one of two options. The first option is that I'm going to allow you to ask me 60 questions. You can ask me any kind of question you can think of, and I'll have the answer because I've really done my research here. So you can ask me anything from health to political beliefs to their secrets to their neuroses. I'm going to have all that knowledge. So you can ask me any targeted question that you want, 60 of them. Your second option is that I'm, I'm going to allow you to watch the person on a Sunday afternoon for 60 minutes. So you're not going to interact with the person. You're just going to be like a camera on the wall watching them go about their daily life for 60 minutes on a Sunday afternoon. So those are your two options. Now, give me a show of hands. Who wants the 60 questions? Okay, now who wants the 60 minutes? Okay, there might be a vague bias to the 60, mi uh, 60 minutes, but it's not, um, it's not what I had anticipated. But that's why you gather data. Okay, so I'll just tell you my preference besides water, my preference is to have those 60 minutes. Because I think you learn a tremendous amount about someone by just observing them in their natural habitat, by looking at the things they attend to and the things they ignore and the people they talk to and the ways in which they talk to them. I think you just gather a lot of data that way. And frankly, I don't trust myself with 60 questions. I don't trust myself to ask the right questions and the most important and most informative questions. I would rather just gather data by watching someone in their natural environment. And that's also the way I would like to study social psychology and social neuroscience. Because I think you learn so much that way. And this approach to psychology is something that a cognitive psychologist named Alan Kingstone has called cognitive ethology. And his idea there is that psychologists can be like ethologists who camp out in the woods or in the wilderness and they study the birds of paradise or the snow leopard or what have you and they watch them and they gather a tremendous amount of information just by watching life happen. But that's not really how we do things in social psychology and social neuroscience. Instead, we bring people into the lab and we have them fill out questionnaires and surveys and we have them do tasks where they, we look at their performance on a series of trials or we stick them inside a brain scanner and we see what areas of the brain lights up when we show them a specific stimulus. So we study the brain and the mind in isolation. We pull people out of their natural habitats and we study them in isolation. Now, we, there are good reasons for doing this, because you need the laboratory to study cause and effect, because you need to be able to manipulate cause and then measure effect. And it's very difficult to manipulate a cause in everyday life, and it's very diff difficult to measure effects outside of the laboratory. First of all, if behavior is totally unconstrained, what do you choose to measure? And more importantly, you can gather all kinds of measures inside the laboratory. You can really answer your 60 questions. So it's difficult. It seems like this either-or situation where I want my 60 minutes outside in the natural habitat or I could get my 60 questions in the laboratory. So what I try to do is I try to bring the wild into the laboratory. I try to bring naturalistic contexts into the laboratory using virtual reality. So I build 
complex, unpredictable environments where we stick participants in them and we just see what they do. Give them a relatively simple task and see how the rest of their behavior and their physiology and their subjective experience unfold within that environment. So for the rest of the talk today, I'm going to show you a couple of these environments that we've used over the years. I'm going to start with one that we used at the University of California in Santa Barbara, and this is work I did with Heidi Kane and Nancy Collins and my mentor, Jim Blaskovich. And what we wanted to know was, if you're in a stressful situation, does the presence of a supportive or a non-supportive close relationship partner affect that level of anxiety that you experience in the stressful situation? Now, that's a simple question, but it's a very difficult thing to do in the laboratory because first, how do you threaten people in the laboratory? How do you make them uh, stressed? And uh, you'll learn a little bit about that later. Uh, and the other thing is, how do you manipulate the behavior of a close relationship partner, a real close relationship partner to the participant? How do you manipulate that behavior to be supportive or non-supportive? So these are very difficult things to do within the laboratory. So what we did is we did it within a virtual world. We brought participants into the laboratory and we had them bring their husband or their wife or their boyfriend or their girlfriend. And then we split them up and we put them in two separate rooms. But we told them, okay, you're in separate rooms right now, but we're gonna bring you back together in the same virtual world. And you're gonna be wearing all kinds of motion capture equipment so you, and you'll have an avatar in the world so you can interact with each other, uh, wave to each other, see each other in this virtual world. So then, we stuck the participants in this environment. It's a cliff environment where participants, um, there's a, a path along the cliff, and we just told the participant, okay, we just need you to walk along the edge of that cliff. And we made it as frightening as we could make it. So we added uh, wind blowing past the one side of you, and we had rocks tumbling over you, uh, and we had vultures swooping overhead. You can see a bit of a a vulture there. Uh, so we tried to amp it up as much as possible, and it was a surprisingly stressful task. They're wearing the head-mounted display, the goggles, and they're trying not to fall off the edge of the cliff. Meanwhile, across the canyon from the participant was their partner. And although we told the participants you would be in the world with your partner, what we actually did is we manipulated the partner's behavior. So, in one situation, we made the participant's partner non-supportive. So this is the guy on the right. He didn't really pay attention to the participant at all. He just kind of looked out over the canyon and enjoyed himself within the uh, virtual world. Meanwhile, the partner on the left waved and clapped and nodded at the participant, and I think most importantly focused on the participant as he or she was walking along the path. So this is the manipulation we did uh, to manipulate the behavior of the partner. And what we found was that indeed, the presence of this non-verbally supportive partner reduced the emotional duress of being inside that stressful virtual environment. That's the first thing we learned. But what I found was particularly interesting was the unconstrained behavior of the participants. So what was interesting to me is that the participants with a supportive partner actually looked less at their partner during the task. So they looked up and saw their partner supporting them, and then they looked down and followed the path, just as they were instructed to do. But what was interesting and slightly tragic was that the participants with the non-supportive partner kept looking at that partner throughout the task. So they kept doing this behavior that took away from their ability to complete the task, but they kept looking to that non-supportive partner who indeed never offered them support. And this nonverbal behavior carried over into a subsequent task where participants interacted briefly. And indeed, the participants who had had the non-supportive partner kept themselves a little away from their partner afterwards. So there was a sort of a nonverbal distance that uh, was created between the two by this virtual environment. And we debriefed people afterwards, just so you know we did it. <laughs> and then we set them free, yeah. And we, yeah. Um, so what we learned from this study, I think, is both that you can use these virtual environments to create an emotionally evocative situation, and you can manipulate the content and the social content of a virtual environment. And it's this feature of being able to manipulate the emotional content that brings me to my next virtual world and my current favorite. And this is one that we made at the social neuroscience department at the Max Planck in Leipzig. And my students and I made a world where we wanted to study threat. Again, we wanted to study threat, but we didn't want to study threat to one event 
or a series of trials. We wanted to study the experience of being in a threatening and unpredictable environment that unfolds over the course of several minutes. So the world took five minutes, and what we did was we placed participants in an empty room, a seemingly empty room. So what we did was we watched a lot of horror movies, we got a lot of ideas, and our plan was to recreate that scene in the horror movie where the character goes up to the attic or down to the basement to look for that, that Ouija board or whatever they've been uh, looking for. And it's a dark room, darker than it appears on the screen right now. And their task was just to walk around and gather these jars. So. Uh, we just started in an empty room. This went on for a little while and with this ominous mu music, which proved critical, incidentally. And then, as time went on, terrible things began happening. <laughs> so some crates exploded, uh, and, and th so things became more uncertain. And then we filled the room with vermin. In this case, spiders. So um, sometimes it was snakes, sometimes wasps, uh, sometimes centipedes. Uh, so we had a variety of different vermin to keep life interesting. Uh, and then we also, during this time, we put the sound in people's ears, so it sort of felt like a spider was crawling on their heads. Uh, and then someone crawled across their face, which was a, a nice touch. And so um, then we went on, the world went on, and things calmed down, the spiders went away, and then we created this sort of um, loosely ominous situation where there were footsteps following the participant. Uh, and then there were, the, there's the cocking of a rifle and then the explosion of blood all over the room. Uh, and then things calm down again and we come to uh, uh, the crescendo uh, where the floor began to collapse. And this is generally the most effective part of the world. Yeah. We had originally filled the pit with spiders, but that uh, proved too, too much. Okay, so then eventually the floor returns and things seem calm until a monster spider comes out and chases the participant around for a while. So you get the picture. So anyway, we really amped it up, and when we first ran the experiment, we first had a pilot subject. I was there, all my students were there, we had all worked on this world for so long, and the first pilot subject screamed, and we, the pride the pride that we felt. I had a tear of joy comes to my eye just thinking of it. So while participants were in room 101, which incidentally was named after the, George or the uh, torture chamber in George Orwell's 1984, that was our inspiration, um, after, when they were inside the world, we had all kinds of physiological measures on them. So we were measuring their heart rate and their skin conductance, which I'm showing here as physiological arousal, because it's a measure of physiological arousal. But we also did something that you can do uniquely in virtual reality, and that is that we made a movie of the participants' experience just from their viewpoint as they were in the world. And then afterwards, we played that movie to them, and we had them say with a little rating dial how aroused they felt at every point in the movie. And so we got this continuous record of their subjective experience, so what they were feeling, what they were actually feeling in the moment. And I'll show you those data and what's um, beautiful about those data is, for one thing, that you see this um, beautiful match between the uh, physiological experience and the subjective experience. And I think what's more important to our purposes here is that you see the dynamics of an emotional experience. Things build up at the beginning as that ominous music begins, then you get spikes when you have an explosion, and then arousal swells in the presence of the spiders. And then people, particularly people who are good at emotionally regulating themselves, calm down when the world calms down again, and then amp up when more threats reappear. So, I think Room 101, what it illustrates is how virtual environments and this kind of unconstrained style of measurement can measure dynamics in human experience and behavior and physiology, can really help us try to understand how things unfold over time, not in the way that traditional experiments use trial by trial and tr looks at little moments in time. We look at how things unfold and how people choose to behave and respond as things unfold. So why is this important? to social psychology and social neuroscience. Well, 
I think this is important because the nature of human experience is dynamic. We're embedded in an environment and we're bombarded at every moment with different information and sensation and thoughts and feelings. And if we want to understand human experience and if we want to understand uh, human psychology, then we're going to have to figure out ways to manipulate and measure that stream of experience inside the laboratory. And I think that virtual reality is a great tool to do so. Thanks. <laughs>